Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome back to this course decoding comic studies and reading graphic narratives in 21st century India. So I am just continuing where I left because uh, this uh, uh, lecture right is continuation of, uh, 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 of uh, the Batman and Watchman. So I have kept the title the same reading the graphic novelist part 2 because there is something that is it still has to be discussed more in detail. So, the last time I was also talking about as you could see the slide, as you could see the slide that I was talking about that how the superman, right, how the uh, superman's color signifies something different. So, we have like we discussed this in the last class. So, moving ahead from here that you see that consider this evaluation from Batman looking trim and triumphant in blue, right, you see that. Only tinted blue carry a flag drabbed cops to a thick brutish Batman in a black, right? See, in a black. A vigilant Batman recapturing his youth versus a Batman that is feeling his age. So, here you see two things is being shown youth and age. Color is not the only meaningful change between the images, but if it but it heavily reinforces the meaning that exists and when uh, we see what is Carrie Kelly put like what she is doing but like like then then what is Carrie Kelly but truly youthful optimistic determination you see look at the her color like you see the color contrast this color this color this color like this color and then you see this color so it is not just done randomly that is a purpose to see. So, here you see optimistic determination like something like the our tar of energy you know. So, she is the part of a Batman that really thinks he can make a difference. This is a mirrored when Van says that she is a young, she is a smart, she is a brave with her I might be able to end this mutant nonsense once and all. So, when this statement is made, what we think about that how things are being mirrored. She is also one of many next generation in the Dark Knight Returns. Others are the mutants who declare themselves not a gang, but the future, the sons of a Batman who declare that the mutants are history and they instead or the future right. So, here you see two things is being shown history versus future. This include police commissioner Yindel and the jokers explosive robot children. It would be easy to see Kelly as a sincerely hopeful symbol. Kelly loses some innocence, but does not undergo any sort of devastating disillusionment nor any of the sort of a violation that is stories are so often eager to heap upon female character. It would be easy to see her and Yendal women as the modern highest to fighting the world's ills, right. So, here you see now something yellow comes uh, on your slides, but yellow is consistently used in two other crucial compiling context. First, yellow when is fire is being depicted or firearms right and secondly when depicting the mutants in their brightly lit teenage arcades right this is the two things. In other words the color draws a direct connection between vicious vivacious youth and violent disaster. So, you see the point is that why sometimes mutants are also shown in yellow and the fire is also shown in yellow. 
So you see, the fire is something devastating, so dangerous. It should be controlled. It should be civilized. It should be tamed. Otherwise, it has a potentiality to, do, to bring devastation on the humans, right? In the same way, so the color is yellow sown and that is the particular reason why mutants are also sown in yellow for a very basic reason that they are young, volatile and they can act like a fire, bring disaster on the humans, right? So look at the slide again and think about the slides. So here you see uh, that yellow is consistently uh, is used to show this kind of a kind of a context where uh, this book in fact uh, several times uh, it, it, it is making this point several times that Batman runs a risk of burning up energy and the idea of a new blood which is neither good nor bad but can go any which way. It can light up an arcade or it can blow up North America right. So, this is what you have to think. So, grey lastly is the color of ambiguity grey right grey is the color of ambiguity right it is what you get when you pour everything else together like how do you get uh, this color when you pour everything together of course batman color would be grey he embodies the collapse collapse of moral dichotomies and is therefore a fitting protagonist for a book about exactly that. In a key sequence, Batman battles the mutant leader in a muddy pit and everything is so grey that it becomes difficult to tell the characters apart. Significantly, the story leading up to the mud fight is full of dualities and chaoscoro. The fight here you see in issue 2 comes after the defeat of Harvey Dent in issue 1, who is all about duality. Dent represented the idea that you could draw a clear line between man and a monster and choose one or the other at any given time, but even Dent was giving up on his two-faced inclination, pretending to be all man again, while perhaps believing he is all monster. At least both sides match. In a really hilarious moment, he ransoms Gotham for 5 million dollars instead of the more aesthetic too because he has got bills to pay. So it is no coincidence that in this issue following Dent's defeat, Batman's greyness seems to visually take him over. As Bruce Wayne says, the room is split between light and dark, clean and dirty, but the split is not even, it favors the dirty. On the subject of ambiguity, the mutants, the US Army, the Superman, a Soviet spangled bomb and Bruce Wayne's heartbeat are each at times depicted using red highlights on a black field, you know. The repetition draws a clear connection between multiple violent entities that we might have been inclined to think were so different, but whether violence is thanks to a mutant or a missile, it is a still violence, right? And no matter how just he think he is, violence is also Batman's beating heart. So now, the association is key because it makes things more complicated. Because the point is not that criminals, law enforcement, imperialism, vigilantism or any of these forces harm people. They do for obvious reason. The point is that squabbling about whether violence look justified, misunderstand what violence is, right? A bottom, it is an ugly form of a power, a means of a control that does not stop being ugly no matter who uses it. Squabbling is the thing that talking heads to, to do throughout the book. They are the people who spend their time debating whether Batman is in the right while not actually doing anything themselves. They are the people who want to declare that Batman's old nemesis are reformed. Whereas, we the audience have learned to be suspicious of narratives by the end of the book. So, Bruce Wayne finishes the Dark Knight Returns at the top of his own little crime fighting cabal 
all of the young energies people supposedly united by supposedly do good mission. He is beaten Superman which means he is symbolically beaten the idea of a violence made pretty institutionalized. He is no longer chasing death and instead wants to forge a life yet it is a bittersweet ending in part because of the imagery he still calls his group an army. His heartbeat is has not really stopped will things really be any different right. So, so the point that is constantly being made that violence can never be a good it does not matter who uses the violence either it is a state or either it is a villains or is a bad people but violence always begets violence and uh, there is we are supposed to condemn if a violence is being produced in any form through any means right so this is exactly what constantly being talked and discussed all right so look at the slides again and you see that we know that jokes are funnier when they are told certain ways we know that some action sequence drag and others are exciting we know that same notes played in an orchestral or a new egg is bossa nova style would be drastically different experience these things all come down to a rhythm rhythm is the art form of emphasis it is about expectations and follow through it is about mood the dark night returns shows as the particular ways in which a comic book book could have rhythm you can have rhythm in the text that is a poetry when batman repeats his desire for a good death in each issue and then in the ends the book having found a good life that is a poetic repetition it is a kind of a punchline a phrase that only has a meaning encoded in it because of the built up expectation that a good life subverts the repetition also add structure to the story it is like a beat it helps you organize the narrative information in your head the way that color helps you organize the visual information you can also have a general narrative rhythm right this that is a rhythm based on what happens and how much of it it is the story starts slow and then speeds up and then gets slow again that is a rhythmic choice if a story focuses on certain character at certain time that can be a rhythmic choice too in the case of the dark knight returns the choice to feature one more antagonist per issue is a matter of a narrative rhythm in the first issue the antagonist is harvey dent right in the second it is mutants in the third it is the joker and in the last it is superman himself so this short of a repetition naturally lends itself to seeing these antagonists and what they represent as increasingly important concepts that batman needs to defeat whether it is just batman that character that needs to be defeat def to be defeated or to defeat the antagonist or it is to grow with the peace or whether one needs to defeat those antagonists symbolically to at peace with oneself or whether we the audience need to defeat the cultural forces that the antagonist are associated with right read this uh, slide very carefully because this is where i am making an entire point right let's not even get into right let's not even get into whether or not batman really defeats anything at all the fact is that superman structurally is the boss fight of the book means that we pay special attention to what he might signify now when we uh, looking at however lots of medium can have a poetic and narrative rhythm what is most exciting about the dark knight is visual rhythm which means that the way it culminates in the form of visual punch lines and calls back it is a sense of a visual rise and fall and its ability 
to wave multiple threads together on any given page is basically symphonic. It is rhythmic at every level too. On the smaller scale, it has these wonderfully succinct little sequences like Superman introduction or Harvey Dent's farewell. Those two sequences both have very simple concepts meant to make simple but powerfully parallel between Superman and state authority and between Batman and Dent and their respective inner monster. The Superman sequence plays of the assumptions that if you zoom in on something you will, you will just keep on zooming in. But instead as the frame zooms in on the flag, it becomes a different symbol entirely Superman. The dent sequence establishes a pattern on the first line and then repeats it on the second line using a Batman instead of a dent. Both set up a visual expectation and then twist it. But not only do those sequences have internal rhythm, they also use motifs that are repeated elsewhere in the book. Both the American flag and the roaring boat reappear multiple times like the good death line. These repetition add structures to the narrative. Every time the flag or the bat show up, we know we are supposed to be thinking about myopic symbolism or the state of Batman rage. Right here you see multiple panels have been brought before you on your uh, uh, screen. Speaking of image, right? I am deliberately showing you because uh, you see and listen to me that will make a lot of sense. Speaking of image that gets repeated, all we need to do is to take a look at the five page sequence in which Bruce Wayne revisits his parents murder and decides to return to his vigilant ways. Unlike the most the entire rest of the book, these pages are organized into sharp full page grids. They feel obsessive and claustrophobic. They capture both the immediacy and the slow motion unreality of watching something terrible happen. You can feel how Wayne is trapped by this memory. He stares and his mother's pulse stare back like the other two sequence. This sequence builds up premises that it then manipulates. But unlike the other two, it is just, it is not just telling a single joke, it is telling two in tandem. One about how Batman feels trapped and another about the claustrophobic nature of the comic panel itself. Over the course of the sequence, the rigid grid structure begins to break down. The third page that, like, that has the row of a closer cut, almost oppressively urgent images. The fourth page has the words, you cannot escape me literally floating between the white bars of the panels while depicting a sky that extend beyond those bars. It also features the diagonal lines of the sower like uh, think about action and fluidity, right, uh, fluidity. So cut between panels from the earlier part of the sequence, the part we now associate with being trapped, it is not coincident that the toppling statue has the same diagonal lines. The whole page is training to escape its visual confines. The prison imagery on the last page makes the mood of entrapment visually explicit. And when the bat finally bursts through the window, it is almost a relief. It is the climax of the five pages of a build up. But that sequence is unusual for the book in focusing on just a single character moment for so many pages. In fact, the unusualness of it helps contribute to the claustrophobia and that is has a more rhythm. Most of the time each page juggles multiple threads of plot and the idea at once. Take this random pair of a page from the middle of Hunt the Dark Knight, alright. So see what something that you interestingly find. Uh, in these slides what I was trying to show that there are n number of pages, 5 to 6 pages talking about one small thing that was the first time uh, was brought in this comic book or lesser graphic novels, right. And this is a new technique that you are supposed to think and also 
something as a claustrophobia and something as I, I have been telling you that the past that haunts right it is brought together on the same page. So, this is a new method and new technique that is uh, 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 that is brought before you all right. So, look at the slides again and you see that uh, how many story threads are present here look at it how many story threads are present here that is your job to see there is the joker on the tv right there is a joker on the tv you see there is a flying gas bomb right there is a flying gas bomb there is a batman battling the police there is a kelly in the helicopter right that is a fair amount of a story but there is even more idea in the police battle we have batman doing the his usual monologuing that is a point i was making sorry batman his monologuing that is a technique right think about it so in the police battle we have batman his usual monologuing and his monologuing about his weakness and age think for a second right batman is speaking to himself or saying something about weakness and age when he is a in a fight the grayness the color the grayness of the fight on the first page directly evokes the grayness of the mutant mud fight right that you saw like i have shown you before i will not go back but i like i have shown you that the way he is fighting in his in the mud fight the same color color is a grayness only this time he is battling a strong young policeman instead of young criminals then we have a parallel between kelly and the robot right keep looking at the slide right what we have we have a kelly and robot both are young flying back up and on the first page her panel and the robots are right next to each other right batman is not just batman is not just surrounded by the young in battle he is visually surrounded by them too the joker bit also gained its power from patterns that were set up earlier in the story it switches quickly between what is happening in the real life right like as i said that lot of time tv is also shown and uh, uh, like what is happening in the real life and what is shown in the tv making you notice the distinction right there is a deliberately showing that what is happening in the tv and what is happening outside in the world is trying to talk about that you be aware of the distinction you should not get confused between these two it chops up speech boxes above the tv screen and when the final box goes blank it is chilling both in the contrast with the quick dialogue from earlier and because we have never seen that sort of visual silence before in other words not only is there rhythm within the individual visual threads there is also a rhythm across the whole two pages spread right this one this two and what you see nothing but the visual rhythm right so uh, and, and 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 that is just those pages throughout the book there are as many small scale crescendos like the blank box as there are big crescendos like the screaming bat or any of batman's big splash portraits that level of control and coherence means that not a single moment feel wasted or boring now understand something crucial here this series is not about why works are historically good but about how it handles context it makes a great artistic use of the expectation that we bring to it 
this is a clever thing to do because any Batman comic that is not the very first Batman comic will be on some level derivative. That is the point I wanted to make. I am repeating it for you. This is a clever thing to do because any Batman comic that is not the very first Batman comic will be on some level derivative. It will derive from other work. You can say, you can say that the same for almost all art really given that most artists live in a society and have consumed other art and so any art that they make probably use that context in some way to create meaning, but that is getting a bit abstract. Point is the Dark Knight Return is not just a comic, it is a Batman comic, an official Batman comic at that. Reader in the 1986 might have read it with decades of a comic superhero comics or Batman comics baggage to say nothing of the baggage that readers have today. Even reading the Dark Knight returns in total ignorance of a comic history. Character like Batman, Superman, Robin, Gordon and the Joker is still all mean something to the reader. One of the reasons the Dark Knight return is so satisfying is that it makes this potentially ponderous history work for it rather than against it. It finds the essence of what the Batman characters are symbolized and then manipulates those symbols to some degree. It is about the fact that characters are symbol more like a uh, icons, right. So, this is what I have been talking about and explaining to you that uh, you are not supposed to look at Joker as a villain or as a Batman as a hero or any characters for example. We are, they are being produced as an icon or let us say as a symbol and they all are conveying something to us. They all are making us a, a, a change uh, within the human beings and how we all are together. So, it is nothing something that comes from the outside as I have been repeating this point that something from the within and we all are point, we all are at one point or like one of them, alright. So, looking back again the slide if you see that uh, you can read the book without noticing how much of a role the media plays in it. Every single narrative moment is processed and represented by newspaper and TV, uh, TV personalities, none of whom see really speak the truth. This might seem like uh, a, a trite indictment of a journalism, right. So, if the book were not constantly reminding us that uh, comic books and any other forms of storytelling are engaged in that exact same practice themselves. Superhero comics are classically a pulpy genre, full of soothing stories about good and evil triumphant, strongman heroics, a comic panel like a TV screen is a frame and like any frame it can be used for things like optics and politics as much as it can be used for grand artistic pursuit. In other words, any form of narrative is potentially in the business of iconography. One of the best thing about the first issue is that the way it juxtaposes all these powerful images of batsman in action with Bruce Wayne's inner moaning about how his body is old and in pain. This short of irony would not have the same impact if we were not so primed to associate superhero imagery with youth and strength. Similarly, when the other characters fail to live up to their immortal comic book selves, it would not mean the same things if the audience did not have the knowledge of what the characterization normally are. It is not tragic to see Dent lose his duality unless you knew there was something to lose. It is not uncomfortable to see a catatonic purposeless version of the Joker unless you are used to him being the gleeful face of absurdist nihilism, right? Absurdist nihilism, right? So, it is not wrong to see Selena Kelly trussed up in Wonder Woman's uniform unless you know that like Batman, she is an ambiguous figure, a mortal woman always on the verge of either crime or reform rather than a superman like goddess of a justice. It is possible 
that Batman dressing as an old woman at the beginning of issue is not to Calais Catmon's very first appearance, where she also dis disguised herself as an old woman. Even more interestingly, the book takes this comic book context and then connects it to the reader, connects uh, to the broader cultural context. It takes real people like David Letterman in Doctrine, Ronald Reagan and Dr. Ruth and treats them alike comic book characters at the same time that it forces its comic book characters to experience the indignities of real life. It also depicts those comic, comic book character using almost uh, periodically explicit real world iconography. Superman gets link imagistically associated with variously authoritarian propaganda, a storybook romance, the American flag and Dr. Bratlomi Wolper who initially bears a hard to ignore resemblance to Hitler. Batman in turn gets associated with the French Revolution equestrian st statutory, statuary cowboys and anti-war posters, right. So the fact that all these imagery is so heavy handed is a clear indication that it is not just there to show how Bruce Wayne sees Clark Kent or himself or how the world sees them. It is not there just to imply that Superman is a bad and Batman is a good. None of the Batman images are really all that positive even if they are stirring. Rather the point seems to be about the power uh, of image in general, right. So, so as, as I have been exploring this point and making this that it is not simply that someone is good or someone is bad. That is not the point uh, is being made uh, with uh, Batman uh, comic stories, right? I'll say this uh, graphic novelist. The point that is being made is that uh, it's not about good versus evil. It's all about that there is evil in every one of us, maybe, right? And you see that it's more exploring masculinity, power, violence, and dominance. Right, so look at the slides and read it for a second. We must not remind them that giants walk the earth, but he himself is behaving like a giant, right. Here you see, there is just the sun and the sky and him, like he is the only reason it is all here, right. It is nothing is showing the power, right. So then he runs everything by talking like something like that is being shown. So, image is what people use. Look at the images. I am just showing you these images just to ask you to reflect upon that what does this image speak to you, right? Just image. This See this image? Nothing is written here in the entire image. Image is what people use to imply that one vigilant is novel and another is menace. The idea of a Batman is as a dark knight is just as romantic as Kent's open certain posing, if not more. The book seems to mock people who say that Batman represents the return of American fighting spirit as much it seems to mock the precedent, so God damn it version of dissembling. So not only does the dark knight returns make full use of the comic book context to convey idea. It then positions comics within a larger cultural ecosystem of imagery. Cultural ecosystem of imagery, right? It suggests that perhaps the way people felt about their superheroes in the 50s was how they felt about their human war heroes too. It suggests that to keep depicting heroism the same way might be covering up something grotesque. It collapses the distinction between images we consume in art, uh, images we consume in real life. Wherever you go, people are telling you stories, right? So, so the interesting thing is that uh, when we uh, uh, we are looking at it, it's all about that we see images in real life are also available the same way we read in the books. The distinction between 
what is what we find in a real life and what is shown in the art is blurred right so in fact it shows to us to a point in fact which is why in the <coughs> when you read it you see there is a zone that dated that you are something watching in television and then it is also showing something that what is happening in real life so in the comic uh, uh, book itself it is shown that you make sure that what is happening outside and what is being watched is a different however when we read closely the when narrative moves we find interestingly that the line between these two like what we consume in real life and what we consume through uh, reading is something uh, difficult to make any distinction between all right so moving to the slide now you see that uh, alan moore is an english writer who is widely recognized among his uh, peers and critics as one of the best comic book writer in the english language he was born on november 18 1953 in northampton england moore entered the public publishing industry in the early 1970s working as a writer and artist for a number of independent magazines he broke into the mainstream with the stories for doctor who weekly right something like this doctor who weekly and the science fiction anthology series 2000 ad right so this is a science fiction anthology right yeah uh, so 2000 ad that you can see on your screen but his gift for deconstructing the superhero genre first appeared in 1982 when he resurrected the classic british hero marvel man that is called miracle man in the united states for the magazine warrior right his 1986 work watchman right that is what we are going to talk about his 1986 work watchman is his masterpiece and helped redefine the comic book medium changing the tone of a comics to date moore is known for his influential work in comics including the acclaimed graphic novel that is what we call uh, watchman as well as swamp thing that is another one and then we have batman the killing joke and the ballad of hello jones right that you could see on your screen he is also the mastermind behind the america's best comic line moore is known as occultist ceremonial magician and anarchist and has featured such themes in work like promethea and then we have from hell and we for vendetta as well as performing avant-garde spoken word occult working with the moon and the serpent grand egyptian theater of marvels uh, some of which have been released on cd in october 2022 he announced that he is definitely done with the comics moore has won countless award for his works including the angoulême international comic festival prize for best album for watchman in 1989 and we for vendetta in 1990 and prix de la critique for from hell in 2001 and the british national comics award for best comics writer award in 2001 and 2002 he also won uh, the german max and mortz prize for an exceptional ovo in 2008 overall alan moore is a highly acclaimed writer who has made a significant contribution to the comic medium and has won numerous award for his works right so what we see here that that is the only particular reason that i have picked up elan moore for discussion and debate so initially we saw the dark knight right friends banis and now we are switching to the watchman 
So you have to look at that for a particular reason that I picked it up is that that Moore is extremely known figure in the comic field and also known as a wonderful graphic novelist and just now we talked about his wonderful achievements right. So now what we are going to set the tone is for we are going to read Watchman and we will see as we saw previously what he has to contribute through the Watchman all right. So now look at the screen and you see interestingly that first as you see I have deliberately put the subtitle like this who watches the Watchmen right. Watchmen takes the simple idea of a superhero and forces us to examine why we are so drawn to that fantasy. Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons the artist uh, close the distance between fiction and reality to unearth something a little more disturbing or reassuring depending on how you read it about your place among an obsession with superheroes villain and justice and it is somewhere in that space that we can find a little more understanding about the world we live in. Who watches the watchman appears as a graffiti on a roll down door on an auto repair shop in a panel of the comic watchman. The central theme of the watchman is the question of who watches the watchman. A variant translation of the Roman poet and satirist Juvenal's quick stores deepest to dots right this is what I have mentioned here right quiz custodite ipsos custodies who guards the guards themselves right. So, originally Juvenal posed the question in the context of Roman women and wives Juvenal was concerned about the purity of Roman women and question questioned who would make sure everyone's wife stayed pure and innocent if wives could just seduce whoever was watching them. So, it takes on a little different context nowadays as Juvenal's sexist observation is instead applied to things like police or national security or anyone with any power. So, watchman is primarily concerned with who keeps the people with the most power in check. Look at the interesting question right and more and givens through their immersive saga. So, that the most powerful will do everything they can to stay that way alright. So, here you see now let us look at the story of the watchman. Watchman takes place in a similar but alternate 1985 where Richard Nixon is still pres uh, president and superheroes except for once employed by the government are outlawed that leave some heroes once adulated and admired now on the outs. One of the government regulated heroes the comedian is found murdered which is Purs Roshak a law breaking vigilant detective to reconnect with his fellow former superheroes because he believes there is a plot to kill all ex superheroes. So, over the series 12 issues the intricate plot hangs on another ex hero Adrian Vedet which is uh, Ozem Indias who sees a worldwide nuclear conflict drawing between the United States and Russia and the superpower. His idea is that if the countries unite they would not blow each other apart inspiring him to create a fake enemy to bring world peace. Roshak after breaking a few fingers along the way figures this out and is appalled. But by the time this plan has been fully revealed and partially executed like that is a mass killing in New York have ensued. The other former heroes are then given the choice to go along with the cover up. So, the heroes including the almighty Dr. Manhattan reluctantly go with the Wade's plan despite their supposed heroism they kept the secret to ensure a future where uh, people fearing an interdimensional war trust their heroes more and become more obedient. Roshash is the only hero who does not go along with the idea who prompts Dr. Manhattan to kill him to ensure that no one ever finds out who was behind all the chaos. Essentially the most powerful and good people of this world are capable of the most dastardly things right remember this. Then why do we trust them? Where are our own responsibilities in this? And do these heroes especially care about us 
the way we care about them, right? These are the questions that Watchman is exploring. So, throughout his story, Watchman presents several texts on the morality of a murder, the ultimate judgment of a death, and its implication in the grand scheme of the world. However, no verdict is passed on the world's fate. Rosha's journal containing an account of events leading up to the mass slaughter is left in the hands of a young unkempt newspaper assistant. Most current analysis of the graphic novel disregard the collective ideals represented in Watchmen, choosing instead to focus on a single outlook that allies with their own ideology. While it is important to recognize the different ideas and perspectives represented through the graphic novel, the ramification of the work as a whole cannot be ignored by understanding and piecing together the unique position collected in Watchmen, taking into account the recurring motifs and symbol as well, a completely new perspective is born. So, there is no moral justification for killing, only the justification that individuals places upon it. Unlike other classic comic books, Watchmen does not have a clear protagonist or antagonist. The characters are early human for the genre, struggling through life's various moral and personal obstacles, including bullying, child abuse, and adultery. Most do have any sort of superpowers. What sets them apart is their morality, right? Their minds each feels a deep need to be a hero. And that is what ultimately pushes him or her to become one. Yes, even Crather takes a look at the moralities of this character in his article, Who Watches the Watchman, where he explores the characterization of Roshash, Dr. Manhattan, and Ozymandias, three superheroes, and how they would handle the fundamental question is it ever morally acceptable to sacrifice the interest of a few for the greater good of the many? After detailing the various philosophical and moral ideals each character represents, Crader concludes that Watchmen does not offer a correct answer to the question of whether millions of lives should be sacrificed to save billions through its characters. However, if we were to choose a true hero of the piece, it may be Dr. Manhattan due to the moral middle ground that he represents and his final actions in preserving peace by preventing Rothschild from revealing the truth to the world. At this statement raises more question, if Manhattan is the true hero, why does he allow so much senseless violence to occur and why does he ultimately desert humankind for another universe? Crader's technique of looking at the story in parts, slowly focusing on single characters generally throughout the course of a graphic novel make it possible to see Watchmen's true themes. Instead, by taking into account all that Watchmen has to offer, it is unique characters, recurring symbols and powerful imagery, a new theme within the graphic novel is revealed. That is a very disturbing uh, uh, pictures on your uh, screen. The true sense of morality in Watchmen lies in its lack of a true hero of a right and wrong of a correct answer. The world the watchmen inhabit is dark, gloomy and above all vicious. Around every corner, behind every door, violence lurks and art throughout the comics is graphic and the colors are dreary with menacing black and blood red used wherever possible in a single word, watchman is gothic. In his article, Nothing Ever Ends, facing the apocalypse in the Watchman, Christian Scandier looks at how Moore uses gothic elements and traits to enhance the storytelling in Watchman. Scandier argues that the extensive use of dark blood red color, vivid crimes and violent scenes provides a gothic atmosphere, showing that Watchman's word is a bleak with its glaring negative sides exposed. Ultimately, it is not worth the saving, with a world so gloomy and the air so ominous, lines become blurred. Criminals are not the only one killing, the murder committed by the heroes who are supposed to prevent crime may be seen crueler, right. So, here you see 
that what uh, is shown by Alan Moore in the Watchman is one that he is experimenting with the gothic technique right and you see that the blood and the murder is shown on the screen like whenever you are uh, watching the graphic novel and interestingly the, there are certain questions which are very significant he is asking that what if the one who guards us right who is being guarded by those who guards us right so this is a simple question but looks like needs a difficult answer right so which means like let's say for example these superheroes they are the meant to save us but what if they are the one who are committing this who are the one they are spreading the violence so here in the watchman you see it is uh, like the sense of a, i would say a murder and killing and the violence is shown even in the superheroes now uh, the text watchman is asking us a question how are we going to make a difference between the one who is committing one and right and the one who on the name of saving the crime is already committing the same thing right so here the line is getting blurred and it has become very difficult to understand that who is at what side let's say for example after watching the watchman or let's say for example reading the watchman after listening to the watchman when we are ask a question who is a hero and who is a villain and obviously we looked at the detailed analysis the way it is being done by the other critical thinkers it becomes very difficult to find out that oh yes he is a hero or he is a villain right let's look at the ozymandias character it's very difficult to find out what he does let's say for example the character of a manhattan so these are the question which i'm leaving you with and i'm uh, uh, asking you to read so look at the slides again and you see on the slide Moore seems to uh, use Ozymandias as a foil for Rorschach, a point of a comparison to highlight uh, the distinguishing feature of both characters. While Ozymandias is wealthy, powerful and handsome, Rorschach is a filthy, despised and unattractive. Ozymandias focuses only on the consequence of his action an ideal displayed in his monologue describing his ultimate goal of building a unity that would survive him his ideology obviously contradicts rosch's self focused short sighted moral absolutism of extinguishing evil still in the end even ozymandias with the purest of intention is only doing good for himself for his own self importance deciding that he will do whatever it takes to feel like he is making a difference even at the cost of millions of lives ozymandias struggles to justify his action even to himself is left wondering how long his newly created peace will last with dr manhattan cryptically telling him nothing ends adrian nothing ever ends right so it somehow that's a beauty of the story right that nothing is certain like right? look at this nothing ends adrian nothing ever ends think about the carefully right what does this mean it somehow that is the beauty of the story that nothing is certain that each individual's morality is of his or her own making no matter what the circumstances are they can always change right hopefully for the better more importantly watchman exhibits the best part of being human and what is that our ability to choose our own ideas for right and wrong and act upon them despite being deemed superheroes the characters in watchmen including dr manhattan are all fundamentally human 
in their capacity to change the world, they are in no better position than the rest of humanity, neither on a moral nor an authoritative level. Perhaps the point is not that superheroes can be human, right? The point is not that superheroes can be human, the point is that uh, can the human be superheroes, right? Uh, Moore suggests that because of our ability to choose our own ethics, our own limitations and the fate of the world are ultimately in our hands, which aligns perfectly with watchman's enigmatic ending. So, you see that interestingly when we are uh, reading watchman, right, what we find? We find that this is nowhere trying to give us a proper ending. It is not the plot does not move in such a way that where we can reach to a proper conclusion and we can say that okay, that is how it ends, right. Or let us say for example, there is absolutely no time or we will not find in a position where we can say that someone is a hero or someone is a villain, right. And in fact, the moral labyrinth is constantly being challenged, it is directly being attacked to us, it is directly being told to us that there is some problem with us, right. In fact, the entire moral dilemma is deliberately erupted by the watchman and it is being asked to us that how and where we are going to make any distinction between that what is a good and what is a bad. Now, the second question, when we are talking about the superheroes, it is constantly telling us that superheroes can be the villain, right. Then the question and the answer of this question is yes, superheroes can be villain, right. Now, the so called uh, uh, we have been carrying this legacy that superheroes cannot be villain, this was constantly challenged, this was constantly debated. Now, here we see that the people over here who are constantly working on it, they think that yes, superheroes can be villain. So, what we see that the question is that is it possible that human can be superhero and the answer of this question is given to uh, by watchman provided, right, we use our own judgment. We are the one who keep thinking about it that what is how to sort out the problem. It is not that we have to go to someone else outside and find out that yes, there is someone who can help us, there is someone who can sort out this problem. This is not possible. The possible is that it is among us who act upon it, who think that this is a morally wrong and this is a morally right. Then only we will be in the position to reach to a certain extent that yes, that uh, uh, this is not to be done and believing in the fact that violence creates violence. It is not that if we use violence as a means to uh, let us say to cover up the violence that is not the acceptable way, all right. So, what is directly being asked in the Batman or let us say for example, the watchman is also satirical to certain extent that the people who are standing on the name of a justice, the people who are standing on the name of a peace, if they are the one committing the same crime, then obviously it will be uh, very difficult to guard us, right, or to be guarded uh, by them. So, here you see that one side the criminals and another side the one who are making peace with it, they both are standing on the same platform, all right. And it is up to us how are we going to come out of with this dilemma that is constantly being shown in the watchman. So, uh, look at the slides now. So, if you look at the slide, when you see that what I try to do with this, right, what I tries to, uh, what I tried to do with this, I <coughs> try to give an idea about what entailed in the first superhero based stories to be given the tag of the graphic novel, right. So, here you see that uh, superhero based stories right are uh, given the tag of a graphic novel something one thing that you can 
carry out from this lecture. And one of the major aim of this lecture, right? One of the major aim of this lecture was to introduce you to the story, plot, and analysis of uh, uh, Alan Moore and uh, Frank Miller. So, of iconic work, and it also the purpose was to give an idea about how their work contributed to a rebranding. That is interesting thing that we are talking about. We are not here just to listen the story of the image of a super hero, right. So, it is also this, this lecture was uh, planned to give you an idea about how their works contributed to a rebranding of the image of a superhero, a change that would hence be followed uh, uh, after uh, like after this uh, series uh, in the most iconic pop, just a second, iconic pop culture representation of these characters, right. So, this is also kind of a change that would, that would hence be followed in the most iconic pop culture representation of uh, 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 these characters. So, so, dear students that was the intention that I wanted to bring it before you that is not just white like telling you the story and the plot or something, but the intention was something more. The intention was that how what happened after this superhero comics came before the audience and how people started looking at it very, very differently. And also that how this iconic pop culture representation of these characters. So, when you see that in most of the time it was it was rebranded in the most pop culture representation, it was it came out very differently and uniquely. All right. So, with this I would end this lecture and would request you that please go through the watchman and see the kind of a question that we raised during the discussion, during the presentation that whether you are able to sort out them or you are able to come up with something new and interesting. All right. So, with this take care, good luck and have a nice time. Bye bye. Thank you.